So I'm very excited. We're here with uh, uh, Real Estate Unfiltered again, another episode, the behind the scenes look um, of the real stuff that I think really goes on you know, in our industry from the industry professionals who are doing it. Um, and it's love and heartbreak real estate unfiltered, which Scott, I know you've had a lot of you know, love and heartbreak in your career. I'm so happy, so happy to be sitting here. For me, this is like a full 360 experience. So for those who don't know, um, Scott, in you know, 10 years of doing resale uh, in our business, has done over a quarter of a billion, that's a billion with a B, uh, of sales volume. Uh, he's sold out four new development projects. He was in Real Trends' top uh, 1,000 teams uh, you know, across the country. A super impressive person, but you know, one of those new development projects actually happened to be one of my very first deals, and so for me, just to have it all come full circle, to have the opportunity to work together, uh, and really get like your insights and stories every single day, every single week, I feel like I'm learning, you know, something, you know, from you, and just you have such great insights, such great stories. So, thanks for coming down and sitting and sharing. Tell me, how did you get to how did you get to real estate first? Let's start. Let's start there. So, well, first of all, Ben, thanks for having me, and I'm so thrilled to be a, be part of the podcast and be here at Elegrin. Um, can't wait to see what's going to happen for all of us going forward as things continue to unfold. Real estate. Imagine a hot summer, tank top, gym shorts, and flip flops, walking into a new development on the east side with my ex and his husband. And I had just got my real estate license, so I big, didn't know. Big muscles, like the picture. Big that you muscles, like I just okay. showed you. Big <laughs> muscles. You know, I uh, I actually had a job. My they closed the division I was working for at Williams Sonoma, so I was out of work. And I always had a passion for buildings, real estate, and my dad and I had always talked about doing something together. Um, so I decided to get my license because I had time. And then my friends wanted my opinion about this new development called the A Building that had a swimming pool on the roof. Um, and I went in there, and then I just started talking to Stephanie uh, O'Grady, and she's married now, she's still in real estate, has two children, and um, she used to call me Scooter. Um, <laughs> exactly, because I would scoot around the apartment from appointment to appointment. And uh, she said, you just got your license? We're looking to hire. She said, you need to talk to her boss. And then, of course, at the end of the day, I ended up meeting Dana Pecorella and Richard Cantor at Cantor, Cantor and Pecorella, yeah. which I was there for Another seven years. Well. So, uh, you know, sometimes lesson in life, just show up, you know. Um, you never know what's going to happen. So I think you've done more than just show up. You don't sell a quarter of a billion dollars <clears> by, you know, by just, you know, uh, showing up and you've done I think a lot of things right but you know what this is real estate unfiltered and sometimes things don't always go to plan I mean you've shared with me so many cool wins so many great successes but I think you've had some stuff when you've walked through that door sometimes that surprised you you know talk to me about like tell, tell me a story about like one of those experiences um so Actually, last fall, I was selling a friend's apartment in West Chelsea. I had also put the tenants in place, a young couple, and uh, they were one was going back to school, the other one had a job. And so I knew them, and we were having an open house, and this was the Saturday before the Sunday open house. And I said to uh, Adam, I said, hey, are we on for tomorrow? Tomorrow, 12 o'clock, I'll be there. From I have like four or five appointments coming. So he said, yeah, no problem, no problem. So I remember that night, I was coming in from dinner, and he was going out, and it was like 11 o'clock at night. So I could tell he was with like three buddies, they were having a good time, you know, girlfriend was out of town. Next morning, I walk into, I go, knock, 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 I always get to a listing or open house at least 10 to 15 minutes earlier if I need to get there sooner, depending on the tenants or the owners to do a little, just check everything is okay and clean up. I walk in, knock, 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 no answer. Knock, 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 no answer. I finally just kind of open the door and peek in. I find three guys face down, one on the sofa, one on the ground, 
uh, beer cans, you know, glasses, empty bottles of booze, all kinds of like, you know, uh, honestly, there were lines of coke on the table. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm picturing like the scene from Hangover, and the, like the, the tiger is about to come out with Mike Tyson or something. So. I mean, and I'm like, hello, 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 and then finally, this guy with like this long hair, face planted into the sofa, picks his head up and says, hello, and I go. Where's Adam? He says, I think he's passed out into the bedroom. So mind you, I had four appointments waiting downstairs to come to see this apartment because it was the beginning of the listing. And uh, I had to think quickly. There was definitely way too much work for me to just do a cleanup. Uh, so I had to go down and address it and apologize. Uh, and actually, I was able to get the guys to get up and get out. Um, and some of the people were willing to come back later in the day, so I went up and I cleaned that apartment with them. Oh, you cleaned, cleaned everything. So that was actually gonna be uh, one of my next uh, questions of this, because you strike <coughs> me always as someone who cares so much about, like every person in the transaction you really care about, the seller, the people coming to that open house, like, you know, really everybody. And I, we hear a lot of people just talk about, look, there's so many things in this business that are, outside of your control, outside of anybody's you know, control, and it creates a lot of these just sort of unfiltered experiences. How did you, like, in, in each of those four people, was there anyone that was completely lost, or did anyone end up like you have a good experience with, or like how did you, you know, still maintain or get them to come back later? Like, what are some of those special things that you do in those instances? Well, um, it's a good question, Ben. So there were a couple of people that came with brokers, and I was able to kind of make a little sort of just comment about it that the, you know, that the timing was off. They they thought it was later in the day, and I had to kind of come up with a creative answer that would suffice them. But then I became solutions oriented, and I said to them, they said, you know, my clients are only in town for this afternoon, so I said, you know what, I, I can't promise it. Let me see if I can work any magic. And I talked to each of the individuals, and I got a sense of what their day looked like. Two of them were willing to come back later if they, that they needed to get in that day because they had drove, driven in from New Jersey or had come in from outside of town, and they were just trying to find something that weekend. Um, so initially, everyone was pretty good about that. Uh, going upstairs back to the apartment, um, finally I knocked on the door and I did get Adam, the tenant. He was so apologetic, he, he was a mess. They were trying to clean up as best as they could and I said, listen, I get it, you know, what can I do to help you? You know, how can I help you clean it up? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know. Yeah, I was wondering how that got cleaned up. What? It, it went really fast, um, and um, <laughs> we got the place. And then you know, nothing better than a good can of you know, like you know, bathroom spray to just kind of start walking around. I have my fancy you know wave in the air, and sure enough, um, about two and a half hours later, I was able to still show it to two people. Nice. So, nice. so um, a, uh... Uh, you know, you have to. Uh, you have to get creative, you have to keep calm, because as you said, we talked about this this morning, we, we don't control anything, and sometimes we walk into uh, uh, situations where we just have to keep calm and put our solutions hat on. There you go. Do you, do you have any, um, you know, I mean, to me, this strikes me as something that like could have been a massive, you know, just disaster. I think a lot of people look at things in life as like, you know, X, Y, Z might have been a mistake or unfortunate or something. Do you have any like sort of favorite mistakes or things that didn't go well with other clients that in the long run ended up to, you know, turn out to be just like maybe it's a wonderful relationship or, you know, a great outcome, but maybe started off as like, hey, that could have been a big mistake. Absolutely. Um, actually, this happened last fall. I was renting a $10,000 a month apartment at the Chelsea Mercantile fully furnished, had more of a sort of shabby, chic kind of look to it. They were looking for a one-year rental, and um, uh, it was somebody from overseas. They wanted the apartment, they were qualified. We got the application in, and everything was going smoothly, and I was just a, I was a, 
a hit with the owners. I had just rented their daughter's apartment at the Sky House for $7,500 a month, and they referred me to her parents. Long story short, either myself or my team or the other agent did not follow the board package all the way through, and we had thought it was submitted. So a week is going by, another week is going by. It's now seven days before they're supposed to move in, and there's no you know, no answer from the board. So we called board packager and actually my client was, used to be on the board. So I asked him a huge favor. I said, can you find out from somebody, have they seen this package? Fast forward, they find out that apparently it wasn't submitted because it never went. So now we're four days before these people are supposed to move in. My client's wife says to me, I can't believe this happened. You should have known this better. You should have been managing this. Why didn't you know about this? You know, why is my husband having to, you know, make all these calls to the board and get creative and help you do your job, you know? So, you know, if if they don't move in that day and we lose any rent, someone's going to be held accountable for the day's rent that we lose. So I went from finding a great tenant. I got you full asking on your apartment, fully furnished, you know, and then I became basically from a hero to a zero. Sent him a happy holidays. Then January rolls around this past year. And I picked up the phone to call to say hi. They live up in Vermont. I said, hi, how are you? How's, how, how is everything going with your tenants? The wife says to me, oh my God, you are so amazing. She says, you found us the most perfect tenants. And if you can do that again this year at $10,000 a month, if the listing is yours, and we're so happy with you. And I now back in touch with my clients. They, um, they're not going to sell yet. They're going to rent again. We're going to put it out at $10,000 a month again. And they're giving me the listing again. And I think the lesson to learn is sometimes Part of my friend, shit happens. You know, there's there's so many details in our business, and the key is to have checks and balances. So even though I'm not the agent representing the tenant, it's still my client we represent on the listing side to ensure that that package got put in, even though I reviewed it and made sure it got done. So, um, but it's not over till it's over. I used to do things like they have a baby grand piano in their house. I used to go and water the piano. Did you know that a piano gets watered? I was just gonna say, since when do you water a piano? You water a piano. I because guess that's why all the pianos at my home growing up <laughs> were out of tune. <laughs> so w they have a baby grand Steinway, and apparently they have an actual water filtration system humidifier that you fill water with a special solution and it goes up into the, and it sort of mists out in order to keep the wood from drying out and stay at a certain temperature. So she would ask me to go water the piano. And when they ask you to go water the piano, I thought I'd you were slipping there. I was like, Scott, <laughs> do you mean watering plants for the owner, not water a piano? So, I, I learned something new today about uh, baby grand uh, pianos that I didn't know. So, so I think you, I think the bottom line is don't don't you know if 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 you have a bad interaction with somebody, you can work on right sizing it. You just got to pay attention to details. Um, you know, and put your best foot forward and move forward. What I heard you say, and it's like a big distinction just in working with a lot of people and a lot of agents, I think a lot of people are willing to point fingers and place blame when something doesn't go their way. In that instance, a lot of people probably would have just said, hey, it was this other broker's job to submit the package. And yes, there's some element of that and there's some things that aren't you know, always in the control, but I, I hear you take ownership and responsibility over that. And sometimes that's a very hard thing, I think, for, you know, for people to do, and especially for someone who cares so much about their clients and what goes right with them. And, and look, we're people too, and I think that weighs on, you know, our psyche and on us and can cause a lot of stress for agents at different times. Like, what, what do you do to manage the the stress levels and all these different things. Like, how do you stay as calm as Scott Kogos does through all this <laughs> madness and parties uh, before open houses and other nefarious things that, 
you know, might, might, might even be too unfiltered for this, but how do you stay calm through all the madness? Um, well, you know, you need to make time for yourself. So I actually have to build in almost, now you have kids, so you, you, you get it. So I have to build in almost three hours every morning for myself and my dog. So the way I do is, is, is you have to take time for yourself, do the things that make you happy, find that thing. So for me is I get up around 5.30, I have some time to myself while my dog is sleeping, I frame out my morning, I, I determine what clients I need to give homework to because everyone's sleeping or they could be in different parts of the world. I give my assistant her things that I need done on top of her already responsibilities she has set to do. Then I can take the dog out, play with him. I have my good cup of Americana. Now, Americana is girl, so if I was a boy, you know, cup of coffee, it could be Americano, but I don't think my, my coffee has gender. But I have a cup of Americana. <laughs> I go play I with dogs I, I, in the I didn't morning. I that's where we were moving to. Is no. Gender neutral uh, coffee drinks. Ge gender neutral coffee drinks. <laughs> um, I play with lots of dogs Which in the morning. Which bathroom does your <laughs> my coffee, coffee company, follow you I, into? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, play, with my, play with dogs in the morning, and I take, you know, uh, 60 milligrams of happiness every day. So I, I feel really good and balanced. Um, and then, <laughs> hey, you know, it's... You got to do what you got to do. No, and I mean, the key really is, is take time for yourself. You got to blow off some steam. So, you know, I have dinners with friends. Occasionally I go, you know, maybe bar hopping on a Sunday after open houses with some friends. Uh, you know, you got to let off some steam and have a good time. Because nice. uh, you work hard and you, you know, you got to balance that out. Yeah, I love that just like each morning, the, the reset, but also doing, you know, fun things. Uh, for yourself and I, I mean I've always just found that so important so I think that's uh, you know I think that's great and you've kind of laid out you know for someone who's accomplished so much really like a day in the life too of you know we have this insight into hey what actually goes on I think a lot of people only see what goes on in the um, you know Instagram <coughs> reels or what people want folks to see so it's nice to hear like hey what is actually that you know routine you know routine look like um, some of the things I like to ask or just always ask everybody is let's, you know, for people listening that could be buyer or seller, that could be a real estate, um, you know, real estate professional. So let's, let's start with buyer, or seller, renter. Um, you've hit on some important, you know, things and obviously like that client in that rental situation and other deals you've helped them with, like maybe there's not much they could have done. But w w what break down for me, like what are some of the basics when a buyer or seller comes to you? that whether they come and use you or not are like really, really important things that they should do or just be aware of or how to work with their uh, real estate professional with. So yeah, That's a great question, Ben. I actually had that conversation this morning with a potential new buyer. Um, you have to be honest with them. You, I don't sell really sell anymore anymore. In fact, this is something that you were talking about this morning when we were uh, in our early morning session. Um, I get to I try to be my authentic self, be their advisor. I present information. Um, I said to this gentleman this morning who is looking to buy a, a one bedroom in Chelsea, I said, after spending 47 minutes with him on the phone, and he said to me, and he, he says, I can't believe, thank you very much for spending all this time with me on the phone. He had questions about the building, he had questions about the process, he had questions about uh, I had told him that I have two clients that just got a 30-year fix at 4.65. He said, hey, can you introduce me to those people? Exactly. Everybody Which, should be buying. As of today, the uh, national rate six point at the time of this recording, you know, six and change. So that's a very impressive That's very, rate very that, good. So, yep. But what I said to him is I didn't leave the conversation by saying, you know, hey, we decided this, you know, this buyer, you know, exclusive agreement with me. I said, we're get, still getting to know each other. I said, I don't care if you use me or not. I said, but I want you to find, my suggestion is, is find the agent that you relate to, that you trust, that you want to build that relationship with. Because they're going to work for you in this relationship, in this transaction, and they're going to be a go-to person. 
And I said, my clients literally call me for everything. I had a client who bought a rug that was too big for her living room. She just bought it the Bloom on, four, yeah. on 10th Avenue. Yep. She says, the company wants me to re-roll it. She's a petite young lady. She's strong. But uh, she says, the company wants me to re-roll it and pay $300 to have it sent back. So I can't imagine the price of the rug. And she said, do you have somebody that can cut it down? So I called my contact at ABC. They had somebody, sent it to her. In her apartment, they cut it down, rebound it on one side, and she has now two rugs, one in her living room, one on her thing. So I think you need to show your value, and I think that's where the selling stops and where the trust, and as I call it, pulling them in closer to you. Right, so for that client, you know, I, that, that kind of answers it in really twofold. I think for that client, it's important to know data, it's important to know some of the nuances, but you can't plan for every scenario that's gonna go on. Mm -hmm. And I think working with someone that you can really trust, I mean, I know I've felt that experience whenever I've bought a car or my own real estate or, you know, whatever the case might be. So I think that's just like a great, you know, underlying, you know, sort of bit there. And I think those are some great pointers for agents as well, but maybe same question posed in a different way for the real estate agent who's listening, building your business, building your practice. What are some of like the great, because you're going to experience all these ups and downs. You're going to want to build these trusting relationships mm -hmm. in <coughs> spite of, you know, uh, a coked out party scene happening, uh, <laughs> you know, right before you and everything. So how do you persevere through all that and, you know, build your practice as an agent? What are some of just like headline best advice if you're a real estate agent? Well, I think whether it's a good market or, or a so-called bad market, and I never per refer to a market as a bad market, I refer to it as the market that we're in. Uh, in 17 years, this is now the fifth market change that I've lived through and I'm still standing. Um, it's actually business as usual, but it, more so in a market like this, I call these the learning years. Because when, you know, the last two years were very plenty and a lot of us or most people were very busy, you know, uh, very gratefully because people were fleeing back to the city, needing a pied -a needing another home, graduating, all, all the things that happened, but also um, companies wanting everybody to come back. But in markets like this, I feel there's two important things that have to happen. One is I need to understand how the market pertains to each of my individual clients because it's not a one size fit all, right? And then I think the other part of it is I refer to these as the learning years. These are, this is when I, I get, I work in even harder. You know, smart and harder, you know, obviously you've got to kind of decide what that looks for like each of you. But this is when I actually learn because I have to really understand the market. I have to understand what's happening around us. I have to, it's really more importantly, what's happening in the, the lives of my clients? Because that's the big piece that's, you know, I, I have said this time and time again. Um, I think I'm right because I think I do own the crystal ball that the world is looking for. So it's in my safe. Um, but I think what the key is, is that um, it's, it's like I said, it's not a one size fits all. And if you understand what's happening to your clients' lives and how this or that particular transaction affects them, they'll tell you actually and help you how to get it done. And I really, and I, and they become a partner with you, you know? Um, so I think it's business as usual, just because it's a tough market. So challenging, so I'm still getting up in time. I'm still doing the things for myself and my dog. I'm still getting and spending time with people. I'm still doing my meet and greets. I still have to plan out my business. I actually shifted my entire business because I usually do most of my business by the end of July. I do 68 to 70% of my year by the end of July or by mid-August. And if it's not in contract by October 10th or 12th or something around there, it's not closing this year. So I either plan my business on a 12 month October to October or January to October. And I've actually shifted out to quarter two and quarter three my business because of you know, what's happened in the market. So I think it's being proactive to understand where does your business come from and never get down because um, uh, people want to do things, you know, like, uh, I, I just keep to your regular routine. 
make your calls, send out your e-blasts, stay connected to your, your core sphere of influence. Or if you have a building that you kind of mine, um, you know, I have three new listings coming in my own building and I've got one in contract and one that's on the market, you know? So it's, you know, they're all in different stages and there's a lot of education and what we are is their trusted advisors. There's so many great, I think, tidbits and pieces of information. If you were looking for <coughs> one in there, I think you got five. The pieces that I really heard and take away too is that you, in taking the interest in your clients' lives, I think you, as we talked about earlier, really, really, truly care about people and care about everybody you know, you're, you're working with. Never getting down on yourself and also, I think the last point you hit on, you know, for me, sales is never sales. Sales is education. And that's, I think, like really what you're, you know, you're hitting on with that. Out of all of that, just like quick question, and I'm like, what's the most fun for you and what keeps you going? Um, the fun thing for me is when you walk into an apartment with a client you've been working with, and nobody has to say anything, and you each look at each other, and you basically nod in your eyes, and you go, this is it, this is your apartment, or this is my apartment. Because you've gotten to know your clients, you've done the work, they trust you, and it's become this sort of symbiotic relationship. And you know, and how I'll end off the answer is, I have one client, I'm on my fifth transaction with this family since 2015. Four sales and one rental. Wow. Yeah. Very, very cool. So um, it's been a lot of fun. And, and that's the fun is like my phone, my phone rings. Like, and I pinch myself and I say, somebody wants my help with real estate? And I'm like, still? They're calling me? And it's so uh, I think the key is to stay humble and stay focused and realize that, you know, there's a lot of successful agents out there. And sometimes when markets shift and maybe we're not as busy as we've been, it doesn't mean that you're not a good agent. It means that we just have to adjust some variables to see how we can dig back into it. Yeah, I love that. Well, similar like with your clients, I, I love that answer. <coughs> I, I think this is it. I think we got it on, the, right. uh, on the podcast here. So a ton of great information. I feel like we could, there's more stories, there's more <laughs> things. I also, as I was thinking about that, I'm like, you know what? He definitely didn't say this was it, and that uh, one instance at the uh, the party scene. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so much great insight and information, and I I know just from our conversation, there's so much more. So I'm sure there'll be a uh, part two at some point. But All thank right. you for Thanks taking for the time. Me. This is awesome. This is awesome. And uh, until next time, there's some great unfiltered material here. So thanks, Scott. You're welcome. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Love and Heartbreak, Real Estate Unfiltered. If you got anything that made you laugh, learn, we'd love to hear your comments. Got suggestions? Send us an email at podcast at elegrin.com. Big thanks to our support team, and we'll be back next week with more unscripted stories. And until then, like, subscribe, please share this with friends. And in the meantime, have fun, help people, and enjoy.